Hello, I'm Michael Williams. Thank you for joining us. We'll look forward to your comments as we have this discussion about the pending or possible indictment of former President Donald Trump in New York surrounding all of this alleged hush money payments paid to an adult film star, Stormy Daniels, and the allegations that the president uh, years ago, uh, back in 2016, around that time frame, uh, made those hush money payments and characterized them as legal expenses. Uh, this has been part of an ongoing debate. Uh, and of course, as you at home, and I'm sure many of you will weigh in, uh, in this country right now, there's a huge debate about this, what would be an unprecedented, excuse me, uh, by the way, I should say uh, one of our colleagues is, is leaving, that's the clapping, that's not an editorial comment about what we're talking about. One of our colleagues is departing after about 15 years here, so they're having a little going away kick for it. I thought I should tell you that since you might have heard some applause there. At any rate, uh, the former president said he expects to be arrested, expects to be indicted, as he's argued that it could happen as soon as tomorrow. There's no indication of that. Joining me, and let's bring them up right now, we have Mark Schnapp, defense attorney, noted defense attorney in Miami, and before that, a federal prosecutor, and we appreciate you being with us, Mr. Schnapp, and Dr. Professor Charles Zeldin, a noted political science professor, Nova Southeastern University for 30 plus years. Gentlemen, so let's frame the issues to the experts. Mr. Schnapp, we'll begin with you. A lot of people have said, if or when an indictment and arrest happens, does that mean he's gonna be walked out and carted, carted away in handcuffs? Uh, first of all, what would an arrest look like or be like? How, how would that happen, if it happens? I, candidly, I think it would be really shocking if he's actually arrested. I think um, yeah, that might be him speaking, but usually what I would expect if he's charged, let's sort of take this as an if there, is that he would get a notice to appear or a summons and then he, he would be allowed to surrender. Um, so that's, I think, really what's more likely to happen. I think people, uh, if people are expecting to see him in handcuffs, I would really be shocked. You see, uh, the, one of from his Truth Social site, uh, illegal le leaks just from Donald Trump himself from a corrupt and highly political Manhattan district attorney's office that involves alleged hundred thirty thousand dollar payment to an adult film star, Stormy Daniels, Daniels in twenty sixteen, before he even assumed the presidency. The New York Times has said if he were to be arrested, if he were to be tried and convicted, he could face a maximum sentence of up to four years. And as you look at file footage of the former president, before we jump to Professor Zeldin, Mr. Schnapp, what do you think of this case? I mean, we're talking about, at the end of the day, there's a lot of opinion, and we'll get to that in a moment about, uh, you know, he, he's such a controversial figure in the life of American politics. But the case itself, it would be unprecedented against a former president of the United States. What do you think of the merits of the case, the sense of it? Uh, your thoughts, Mr. Schnapp, then we'll come to you, Dr. Zeldin. Well, Michael, so, so you know, um, I, I did public corruption cases when I was a federal prosecutor. So this is a highly unusual case. And um, what do I th think about the substance? It's hard to judge what the substance is. But I think there are, are issues that are, are very real for a prosecution. Number one is the age of the case. Um, uh, a lot of the payments took place, I believe, in around 2016. Um, I think that uh, the, the New York state laws that are applicable, uh, the basic law is actually a misdemeanor, and it's only a felony if there's an intent to commit another crime. In other words, if you falsify a book or record and there's an intent to commit another crime, that's what raises it to a felony. So I think you're dealing with a very um, untested legal theory to start with, plus statute of limitations issues. And so I think you're walking right out of the gate, not only with an unprecedented um, uh, defendant, um, uh, if he, if in fact he's charged, but you have a lot of legal hurdles to uh, overcome. And let me, uh, we have two comments, and uh, Dr. Zell, this is a good spot for you to jump in. Judith Donato says, never happen, meaning, I'm not sure if she means by never happen, meaning he'll never be arrested, indicted and arrested, or never convicted. Then you have Karen Boscove, who says, no one's above the law, right? If he broke the law, then he should be held accountable. Uh, and then you have others earlier still litigating the 2020 election. Trump, Kathy uh, Grote and others say Trump won all the way uh, up a few columns there. Kathy Grote says that. I, in this cauldron of sentiment and feeling on all sides, fr frame it, frame this issue, frame all of this as you see it, Dr. Zeldin, again, political science professor, many years uh, at Nova Southeastern University. Sir? Well, it's 
politics. Uh, the uh, from Trump's side, it's all about politics. It's all about using this to further his drive for the presidency. Uh, for the for the prosecutor, uh, it seems like the prosecutor is emphasizing the law, and in in that situation, uh, he uh, you know he's 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 he has to make his case. Uh, I think in terms to the never happen, I think indictment is possible. Uh, in fact, in some ways, I think what the announcement by uh, former President Trump actually increases the likelihood of there being a, a an indictment. Whether he the, the the prosecutor wins or loses, though, in trial is a whole other matter. One wag said to me, and there have been published reports, the president's very, very concerned about, or a former president, very concerned about a possible indictment. But one wag, given that, said, uh, almost wondered uh, if, if, if a part of him welcomes it because it's already a rally the base. You have uh, potential opponents as you look on at Mar-a-Lago at home, uh, pictures of Mar-a-Lago uh, already rallying the base around him. And in and, and that sense, sees it as a chance to capitalize on that heading in 2024. They might have said that slightly tongue in cheek, but I've heard it more than once. Professor Zeldin, your thought? Yeah, actually, where it'll serve him most is in getting the nomination. Uh, there were challengers who were lining up to say, essentially, Trump is good, but we're better. Or we can do what Trump would do without all the, the, the hassles. Without, but, but the indictment is a way of early on in the stage. I mean, we're still a year and a half away from, from the primaries uh, for, for Trump to basically line up support of all the people he needs in order to uh, get the nomination. Uh, Mr. Schnapp, again, I'll, you know, go ahead, Mr. Schnapp. I was going to respond to what Professor Zeldin said. I mean, I think no one in their right mind welcomes an indictment. Exactly. And, you know, that, and that, and, that's why I prefaced and, that comment. He's New York Times said, listen, he's seriously concerned, but go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I think so given that it's a high likelihood, he's probably trying to frame it in a way that he's saying, OK, I welcome this and it'll help me. I'll gain support. Um, and, you know, he's even talked about um, gaining having people uh, protest this. But at the end of the day, you know, it is the rule of law that governs. And I think if it and if it's not the rule of law, it, rule, rule, I'm sorry, the rule of law, that's extremely troublesome. But I, I think at the at the core of the, any case, you know, that's what's going to govern. Now, the only thing, I, Michael, when we talked earlier that bothers me is the fact that um, the feds did not pursue the political campaign contribution uh, aspect to this. And I, I'm, uh, that was a little troubling that. And I think people are going to focus a lot on why the federal government didn't pursue this and the state seems to be acting. But we'll have to see what, if any, charges are actually brought. The rule of law, to be sure, but uh, I'll ask in a non-lawyerly way and have you in your eloquent way uh, help set the framework for our viewers. The fact of the matter is that you can't escape the fact it's the former president of the United States. Is this the case you hang your hat on uh, in an, what would be an unprecedented fas fashion, this particular case? I mean, he has investigations swirling around him after the January 6th probe, uh, you know, classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. The, the current president also is facing uh, that headache, as well as former Vice President Mike Pence. And on and on we go, uh, issues about Mar-a-Lago, about that, about uh, uh, alleged pressure against the Georgia Secretary of State. So a lot going on here. Is this the case that you hang your hat on? And I know I'm asking as a non-lawyer, but... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very... Whole... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, that's a very good question. I think that if I had to choose a case to go forward, this would not be it. Not to say it shouldn't be charged, because I you know, I don't know what the, all the facts are, but I would not take this as my lead case. Now, maybe what's governing it is, again, they're pressing against the statute of limitations, and there is some uh, issue about how, you know, how the New York statute of limitations would work uh, be, with respect to someone who is an out-of-state resident now. But leaving that aside, um, I, this would not be the case. I would pick to go first. I think it has the least, um, I don't want to use the sex appeal because that is a little bit of uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I, it, it, to me, that's not the right case to go forward first. Uh, jump, dive in a little bit more. Why? I mean, as a practical matter, we, you, you look at it inside as you're talking with fellow lawyers, as the New York DA is, but as a practical matter, back here in the real world, 
well, it's all the real world. But my point is, outside of that discussion that's going on privately with the DA and his assistant prosecutors, why, in a broad sense, would it not be where you'd go first? If you I, go I, anywhere. Well, I mean, again, th there's an if, big F here, but I think a case where someone is accused of trying to tamper with an election by uh, being involved with the use of false electors or a case where someone is involved, you know, uh, supporting uh, or causing a riot or someone is involved or, or, or former president is involved uh, in, um, in the mishandling of classified documents. Those on the surface are much more serious offenses and have more meat to them than you know, old uh, hush money payments, which, and again, I'm not suggesting that it's okay to do this. I'm just sort of suggesting that um, those cases would seem to be the ones really to go forward first, if the, if any, if he's going to be charged. And just to give a flavor, and then I'd like to get uh, Professor Zeldin to jump in. Rebecca Hoover says that they're going after Trump to, to get to us, the American people. So why is there nothing being done with the so-called person in the White House? That from Rebecca Hoover, if we can pop that up. Uh, there you go, Rebecca, who you see her response. Then below that, uh, Teresa Frost, professor, seriously, please look at the facts, but his lies, he's a horrible person. Uh, on and on it goes, uh, you know, uh, so you, you have this roiling of uh, this polarization and, and all of this plays against that, picking up on Mr. Schnapp's uh, theme. Your thoughts on that? You can't separate what's happening possibly in a court of law from this uh, great chasm that we see that only seems to be growing in this country. Well, that seems to be the, the, the primary problem here, which is how do you separate what is a matter of law from a matter of, of, of politics and society? Um, I, in answer to the earlier question you had asked, uh, if this was the only case being brought, it would be relatively on the weak side. But there are multiple potential indictments coming down the pike and it may be that this is the first to be indicted but not necessarily the first to be argued we don't know it's a question so how, do, of how do we navigate all that as a country with where we're at right now first to you and mr schnapp would welcome your view and then after that we'll hear what the governor had to say today first to you professor Zell. with uh with with, with, <laughs> with how do we navigate all that i mean we, we seem at such a boiling point you're gonna yeah possible indictment here probable if you listen to the former president you have uh, many other investigative fronts open there we've got a campaign coming up uh, I, I talked to a lot of people. They're worried about how we navigate it uh, without pulling um, it off the country. It, 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 is, it is problematical. Uh, we are a nation that is highly divided. Uh, the divisions seem to be growing rather than shrinking. And how you perceive Trump, how you perceive politics is shaping how you perceive these legal proceedings. And with it, people's attitudes. Uh, but we've had periods in the past of high division in which people had various uh, attitudes and differences about uh, politics that played into the legal field. And uh, we moved on from them. So uh, this may be the trial of the century, but there'll be other trials of the century as well. Uh, Mr. Schnapp, to that point, though, you, you brought it up a few minutes ago, you know, uh, the rule of law. But many are arguing, listen, there's a lot of stuff that there's prosecutorial judgment uh, used on. And, sure. and uh, more than a few people said with all the problems and all the crime problems in New York, this is what you're going after. And and like as you formulate your thought in response to that, this comment sums up a lot of, of this chasm I'm talking about. Uh, Brad Ball uh, says Biden family takes, we should throw allegedly, millions from China, our enemy, and launders millions more for the family through Ukraine. These are allegations that have been going around, and some believe that they're absolutely the case. Be that as it may, his statement, you could see it at home. Biden family, he says, takes millions from China, launders millions more with the family through Ukraine. Trump's getting indicted for paying hush money to a porn star. Libs hate Trump more than they love the country. Disgusting. But that's really where the dialogue and discussion is, and, and you can't... Uh, be immune to that as you're weighing the pros and cons and the weight and gravity of charges, uh, whether to charge, not to charge, on and on and on. Uh, how, from a lawyer's perspective, uh, do, do, you, do you navigate that from a, a legal perspective? You can't be immune to it. Uh, I welcome your thoughts. Well, no, you can't be immune to it. And what, what I find very unusual in this case is the fact that you have so many 
political people, ranging from people in Congress to uh, now the governor, making comments about a criminal investigation, highly mm. unusual. And, and that, I think, is actually causing more of a, of, of a chasm in the country. I mean, I think that in an ideal world, this should play out in a court of law, but it's not, it's not what's happening. So what you're seeing is any, you know, and you're seeing anyone from um, uh, people in Congress to the governor making uh, statements. But in fairness, though, there are some people who are saying, wait, you know, we, we also, while we think that this is uh, an unfair prosecution, you know, don't cause another riot, don't go out and protest, don't engage in violence, even from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Which is surprising, right? This woman uh, from Georgia. Mm -hmm. but, 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 me, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I'd like you both to listen. Governor DeSantis was criticized by Trump supporters over the weekend for not weighing in more vociferously, uh, even uh, people who uh, are opposing him or plan to oppose him in 2024, like the former Vice President Mike Pence said. Listen, he can take care of himself, but uh, basically the thrust was this is a politically motivated prosecution. Really, to your point. Uh, Mr. Schnapp, people weighing in on things that are best reserved for the court of law. Be that as it may, the Florida governor this morning in the panhandle, I believe, did weigh in. I want you both to listen, and then we'll have you uh, first, uh, Professor Zeldin, to weigh in. So I've seen rumors swirl. I have not seen any facts uh, yet, and so I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. The, the Manhattan district attorney is a Soros-funded prosecutor, and so he, like other Soros-funded prosecutors, they weaponize their office to impose a political agenda on society at the expense of the rule of law and public safety. He has downgraded over 50 percent of the felonies to misdemeanors. He says he doesn't want to even have jail time for the vast, vast majority of crimes. And what we've seen in Manhattan is we've seen the, sky, the, the crime rate go up and we've seen citizens become less safe. And so you're talking about this situation with, and look, I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to, to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. I just, I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is that if you have a prosecutor who is ignoring crimes happening every single day in his jurisdiction, and he chooses to go back many, many years ago uh, to try to use something about porn star hush money payments, you know, that's an example of pursuing a political agenda and weaponizing the office. And um, I think that that's fundamentally wrong. I also think it's important to point out when you're talking about these Soros-funded prosecutors, yes, they may do a high-profile politicized prosecution, uh, and that's bad, but the real victims are ordinary New Yorkers, ordinary Americans in all these different jurisdictions, that they get victimized every day because of the reckless political agenda that these Soros DAs bring to their job. They ignore crime and they empower criminals, and that hurts people, it hurts a lot of people every single day. These Soros district attorneys are a menace to society, and I'm just glad that I'm the only governor in the country that's actually removed one from office during my tenure. <laughs> And in terms of um, our, 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 we are not involved in this, won't be involved in this. Uh, I have no interest in getting involved in some type of manufactured circus by some Soros DA, okay? He's trying to do a political spectacle. He's trying to virtue signal for his base. Uh, I've got real issues I got to deal with here in the state of Florida. We're obviously shutting down uh, CBDC, which is important. We've got so many things pending in front of the legislature. Uh, I've got to spend my time on issues that actually matter to people. Uh, I can't spend my time uh, worrying about uh, things, uh, things of that nature. So, so we're not going to be involved in it in any way. Um, I'm fighting for Floridians, and I'm fighting back against Biden. That's what I do every single day. So uh, he repeatedly talked, uh, which is a favorite uh, for conservatives, George Soros funded uh, DA and never validated where that information came from. Uh, Professor Zeldin, but governor did go on to say, you know, politically weaponized, uh, given all the other things going on. You heard what he had to say. And already we've had people uh, write in supporting uh, that point of view and, and others who 
uh, are criticizing what you just heard the governor say. Your take on everything you just heard. Well, this is this is a governor who's running for president and who sought to shift the topic around to this is what I'm doing. I'm a governor. This is what I've done. Um, he's trying to minimize any consequences that might hurt him politically as a result of this indictment, if it happens and when it happens. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, it's kind of interesting that here you have a governor who said, I fired someone for not enforcing the law, and here they are. I'm questioning the efforts to enforce the law. Uh, and what, what about the whole, but uh, the, you know, this, the, the George Soros theme here, the billionaire financier who, uh, you know, with, with no uh, evidence behind that, but that's part and parcel of our politics now, uh, both for liberal bases, uh, throwing the red meat to a liberal base, or in this case, a conservative base. It's, it's all about, it's all about uh, signposting. By, by using a phrase, a Soros prosecutor, you are identifying for his audience uh, the situation with this prosecutor. He's, he's painting the prosecutor as liberal, as, as, as uh, partisan pointed, and as somebody who is not really interested in the law. But is only whether, whether, there's, in the whether law. there's any validation of the of Soros or not. Um, I, I, I would note. Uh, Mr. Schnapp, uh, your take on what you heard the governor say, first of all. Um, well, first, let me say, as a prosecutor, you always have discretion on certain types of cases. And if what he's saying is that this is not the type of case, when you talk about payments to a porn store may not, may not be the most efficient use of resources. That, to me, is the only thing he said that has any appeal. But what does trouble me is that when he says, for example, when he says, um, you know, that he, as, as Professor Zeldin identified, uh, that he uh, fired a, a prosecutor who, in his mind, wasn't enforcing the law, and here's someone mm -hmm. who is enforcing the law. But I think there's another factor here that people need to focus on. This case is going to trial, if it goes to trial, in New York. It's not going to be the same jury, and it's not going to be the same sentiment uh, in favor of Trump as it might be here completely different jury pool. And I think that that is not being looked at at all. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Rebecca Hoover says, just to give you a flavor at home, and also if you have specific questions for our guest, Mark Schnapp, former federal prosecutor, noted defense attorney out of the Miami area, or Professor Charles Zeldin, uh, who's been covering the political beat and has been the top political science professor for years at Nova Southeastern. Send your specific questions. Rebecca Hoover says down at the bottom there, Pete, give us straight answers. We all know this is all political, but why? Because they don't want Trump to run in 2024. Straight answers. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Schnapp, would be, uh, put us in that prosecutor's room. What, what kind of pressure is coming to bear on an office like that right now, both pro and con, pro, pro for prosecution, con, not not a way to go. I can only begin to imagine the kind of pressure that is coming to bear on the New York DA's office at this moment. I, well, I think first we start with the facts. I mean, again, and I think that that is the first thing any prosecutor has to look at. Do I have a, a strong case? Can I prove this? And, you know, not that not whether I can get an indictment, but whether or not ultimately I can go to trial and prove it my case beyond a reason, excuse me, beyond into the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. So you, you need to look at the strength of your case and you're going to look, you know, um, I think really the public sentiment in the jury room, I'm sorry, in the, in the DA's office is going to be less significant than people might think, or, or it should be. Because when I was a prosecutor, it wasn't uncommon for uh, people in the political arena to try to influence uh, a political prosecution and a brother a, a prosecution. We would not totally ignore them. Th this is a little bit different, but I think they've already passed that um, threshold and made a judgment uh, you know, that they're going to go forward and see where the facts lead. I, again, I want to be really clear that if, if and when he's indicted, and there's an if, um, um, he, he's an innocent person. He, you know, they have to go to trial and prove it. And that's the first thing that any prosecutor is going to think. Can I prove it? Uh, Professor Zeldin, again, uh, weigh in. Where uh, The comments uh, were really uh, along a theme, both the pro DeSantis, uh, uh, about the comments he made. Uh, others, though, were criticizing him over the weekend. You didn't jump in fast enough to support the former president. You see what the possible indictment could involve. As, as we begin to wrap, I want to give each of you, and, and again, if you're sitting at home and have a specific question 
for either of our guests, please, please send it in. We do appreciate your comments, but if you have a question for these two experts, please send it. Professor Zeldin, as you begin to kind of frame your wrap up, uh, what are the things I haven't touched on that, that you think are important for our viewers to hear as, as we look both now, what's possible, what's coming down the road? Uh, what have we not touched on that you think is important? Well, look, the, the, the situation is that it is unprecedented in that we have never seen a president or former president be indicted. And who, whenever that happens to whoever it happens, it is unique. Add in the, the polarizing nature of the president in question and, and the partisan politics we're facing, and this becomes a big political issue even as the courts are focusing on the legal issue of can it be proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he broke the law or not. Uh, and uh, much as, as, as we, we, we saw 20 years ago in, in, in the, the recounts in 2020, politics and law merge in a situation like this, and you can't separate them out but the courts are gonna to have to do so. And it's gonna be our job to try and look at the situation and uh, understand that uh, not everyone is political in their motivations, not everyone is without politics in their motivations. The politics that matters to the DA in New York is the politics that gets him reelected. It's not the politics of the nation, it's not the politics here in Florida. So. Yes, there's political motivation there, uh, or could be, but at the same time, the issues that we look at and go, "Oh my God, it's 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 politics." Okay. And let me to them. Let me cut in uh, two things. First, Victoria Lane and uh, Mr. Schnapp. Would anyone else be charged for doing the same thing, allegedly classifying this payment? Well, I should say, would anyone else be charged for allegedly doing the same thing, classifying this alleged payment as legal payments instead of a payoff? And Keep that in mind. So that's a specific question for you to answer. Would anybody else be charged? And then Brad Ball asked earlier, if Trump were to be under indictment, could he still run for president? So tackle both of those, Mr. Schnapp. All right. Well, as to the second, he absolutely could run for president. That's not a it's not it's not an issue. Um, the question that the first question was, what if someone had misclassified the payment? If that's all that happened, it would be a misdemeanor. And whether or not that would have been charged. I don't know, you know, uh, possibly, but, you know, you'd have to, to make this a felony, as I said earlier, you have to prove not only that the books were falsified, but it was done with an intent to uh, conceal or commit a second crime. And uh, the question that was posed to me was put in the form of, of what would be a misdemeanor charge. Um, and uh, I don't know that somebody else would be charged, hard to say. Mr. Schnapp, uh, you and I had a chance, uh, you know, you, you, you have such a broad view of this legally. I'd like to give you a chance first. Uh, wrap up the thoughts on things that uh, we haven't touched on that you think are pertinent and important and, and perspective from our viewers who are across the political spectrum on their thoughts on this. Uh, what do you want us to keep uh, close in mind, both from a legal perspective and a, and a broader perspective from, from where you sit and stand? Well, having been both a prosecutor and a defense lawyer, I think I think people need to keep an open mind as to what the facts are, and keep in mind, as I said before, that an indictment is, uh, if if there is an indictment, it is simply a charge. It means it means that a grand jury found that there's reasonable cause to believe that someone committed a crime. What makes it unusual is the fact that it's the former president. Um, I think that there are real legal hurdles to be overcome here. Um, leaving aside the political dimensions, which I don't think anybody could ignore. I, I do agree a lot with what uh, Professor Zeldin said, but I think that, you know, just from a lawyer's pr perspective, I think as a lawyer um, who is defending him, um, it's it, it, it could be a very defensible case. I think the biggest enemy in this case is Donald Trump. I think he makes everything a million times more difficult. He's a difficult client. And, um, you know, he just, he brings on the, I think in terms of what he's trying to do, but make it to enhance his uh, run for a political office is the very same actions that's gonna hurt him in a trial. Uh, I, I did perk up when you said uh, you, you, you see it could potentially be a very defensible case in, in what way? And I, and I know you're looking at the broad strokes, obviously only the DA and his team know the deep specifics, but uh, dive in on that a little more. 
Well, I, again, um, if I were looking at, first of all, I think if, if any case that depends specifically on Michael Cohen is, is problematic. And he's so former lawyer so, fixer for Donald Trump, for those who don't know. Yeah. Right. He's a former lawyer for Donald Trump who was convicted in the federal system. Mm -hmm. Secondly, even though it's not relevant ultimately in the criminal trial, the federal government never pursued any campaign contribution violations against Donald Trump. So that's got to be in the back of everybody's mind. Um, then the next issue is whether or not this case is old and whether or not uh, the statute of limitations has run, whether or not any kind of arguments to extend the statute um, are really uh, are, are viable. And then the next issue really is the core issue is whether or not um, assuming that they could even prove that he somehow caused the books and records to be violated, uh, be, rather be falsified, that it was with the intent to commit some other crime, for example, to uh, a, a campaign contribution, a legal, uh, a legal com campaign contribution. And then, you, you know, and then not, not to be overlooked here is Michael Cohen is a lawyer and whether or not he's a crooked lawyer, he's still a lawyer. And Donald Trump is going to say, look, I had legal advice from this lawyer that this, what I was doing was okay. All right. You know, those Mr. are issues. Mr. Schnapp, uh, thank you. Stand by. And uh, Professor Charles Zeldin, Nova Southeastern University, closing thoughts. Uh, I agree that the big problem with this case has to do with intent. Can you prove the intent to commit a crime that then makes potentially uh, the, the documentation, which it does sound like there is, uh, viable for a felony of conviction? Uh, in, in many cases, the, the best approach in a situation like this is let the court system do what it does and, and, and run its course. Uh, but politics isn't going to let that happen. This is going to be a cause celeb, and we will be talking about this and yelling about it and screaming about it from day one till it ends. And I, I'll, I'll close. Gwen Brister Rose wrote just a moment ago, that all of this she meant will just fuel our fire if the case doesn't have merit. I, I suspect you could also say whether it does or doesn't have merit. Uh, the, the fires do not lead, need a lot of fueling in our partisan divide of America. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us this afternoon uh, to give us perspective on a topic we'll be talking about a lot. Uh, keeping your phone numbers on my hotline nearby, we'll be talking if or when something happens here. The former president suggested tomorrow, we do not know that. Uh, I would say again, uh, for those of you who joined us late, Mr. Schnapp uh, indicated, and perhaps just as a closing uh, closing thought, Mr. Schnapp, because we have audience that comes in and out. If there's an indictment, it doesn't mean that uh, we're going to suddenly see him, well, if he's at Mar-a-Lago, for instance, be marched out of there in cuffs or whether he's in New York or not. This would probably be through lawyers, surrender, head to New York. Fair statement for those just joining us? For, yes. I mean, I, I would be shocked if they laid him out in handcuffs. Okay. I just wanted to, to bring that up, that this will not be that kind of process, and because uh, we do have people who are coming in and out. Gentlemen, Mr. Schnapp, noted defense lawyer in Miami and a former federal prosecutor. I covered in my young days as a cub reporter there uh, more years ago than you and I like to count. And same with you, uh, Dr. Zeldin, Charles Zeldin, political science professor at Nova Southeastern University, uh, who's been doing that important work for more than 30 years. I really appreciate you all helping to frame the issues for audience. And we appreciate all of you weighing in today for part of this discussion. Uh, there'll be more to come. We'll see how it all plays out. Uh, but we'll have you back here. Gentlemen, thank you. And thank you most of all to you who weighed in from home. I'm Michael Williams reporting. Have a good day.